Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sky Harbor Resources Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, President and CEO Jordan Trimble. Jordan will walk us through a company presentation, and then we will be accepting questions live. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time on the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And as always, the summit is being recorded and will be available to you to watch on SIX.com afterwards. Without further ado, I'll hand it to you, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who saw the interview, I believe it was last October or uh, early November. Um, looking forward to providing an update for everyone that's been following the story since then. A lot's happened, uh, not just with the company, but also in the uranium sector. I'll talk a little bit more about our plans for 2021, and I'll, I'll spend some more time on this one, um, uh, on this interview, talking a little bit about the uranium market, um, the ESG component of it that we've seen uh, come in and drive buying more recently, especially in the equities. Um, I think it's an important part of the, uh, of the narrative right now around uh, uranium and around nuclear energy. I'll talk about the supply demand fundamentals as I did uh, in the last uh, interview or presentation and uh, get in a little more in the weeds on that as well. And again, as always, uh, feel free to ask any questions. We'll, we'll leave some uh, time open for questions at the end. So um, uh, bear, bear with me, people that did uh, see the last presentation. I am going to go through some of the, uh, the slides that I went through uh, previously. I want to make sure that people who haven't seen uh, the presentation uh, are, uh, are familiar with the uh, the, the basics of the company. So just as a, a quick overview of Sky Harbor, we are a uranium exploration and early stage development company. All of our projects are located in the Athabasca Basin of Northern Saskatchewan. Uh, it's the highest grade depository of uranium in the world. Um, I'll move on to uh, the first few slides here. So this is just a disclaimer on forward-looking statements. As always, we, we do have we will be making forward-looking statements. So I encourage uh, the viewers to take a read through this when they can. Um, uh, getting back into uh, investment highlights in a, in a uh, high level of the company, um, we like to highlight three key pillars uh, of the company. Uh, that's the people, uh, so that's both the management, uh, the technical team, as well as our strategic partners uh, and our larger uh, and strategic shareholders. Uh, timing has to do with the macro picture, the uranium market. Uh, what's unique about uranium is it's a relatively small sector. There aren't many publicly traded uranium mining companies. There's very few ways to get investment exposure uh, to this sector. Uh, it's a bit old school in that sense where uh, typically an investor looking to get exposure uh, does have to buy the mining companies, the uranium mining equities. Uh, and uh, as I pointed out in the last presentation, um, I believe we are in the early, early days of uh, uranium market recovery and bull market. And then last but not least, the projects, the asset base uh, that make up the company. As I mentioned, all of our projects are in uh, the Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan. We have six projects uh, that we've uh, acquired over the last uh, six and a half, seven years. We have two deposits. Uh, the projects are at various stages of, of exploration and early stage development. Uh, and we are in the process right now of advancing those projects and creating shareholder value through exploration, both at our flagship project, uh, which is called the Moore Lake Project, uh, and at a partner funded project. So we do have now three partner companies uh, that are funding exploration and work at our, uh, various other projects we have in the Athabasca Basin. And uh, that uh, makes us a prospect generator. It's a, an important part of our day-to-day -day business where we basically package our projects up and look for strategic partners to come in uh, and fund exploration. And it's a great way for us to raise additional capital so that we can fund our exploration and advancement of our flagship project, the Moore Lake project. So we'll continue on here to the first uh, part of the presentation, just to familiarize everyone with the team, the management team and the technical team. So I'm the president and CEO. I started running the company about seven, uh, just over seven years ago. I come from a entrepreneurial and financial background. I'm a CFA charter holder. I was uh, doing corporate development work for a gold company previously called Bayfield Ventures, uh, which we successfully sold to a larger gold mining company uh, called New Gold back in uh, 2013 and 2014. Uh, that's when I left to start Sky Harbor uh, Resources. And uh, just as a, a kind of a, 
a prelude. We we are looking to do that same thing here with Sky Harbor. That's the end goal. Uh, go out, have expo uh, exploration success, make new discoveries, uh, delineate deposits, uranium deposits in the base. And then ultimately we are looking to sell the assets or sell the company as a whole. Um, I partnered up with my head geologist, Rick Kazmersky. Uh, for those of you watching from Saskatchewan, I'm sure you're familiar with Rick, uh, well-known geologist, 40-year uh, veteran. Uh, he's been looking for uranium in the basin for many years. He was the exploration manager at Cameco for a number of years. And then he went and started uh, his own company called JNR. Uh, he had took it over and uh, ultimately sold the company uh, to Denison Mines. Uh, Jim Pettit, the chairman, you'll see here, I work, I've worked with Jim for uh, over 10 years now. He's the chairman of the company, a 30-year veteran uh, in the mining uh, space. Uh, on to the next slide here, Dave Cates, a very important part of our board. Uh, Dave is the uh, president and CEO of Denison Mines and Uranium Participation Corp. Uh, so we have a strategic partnership with Denison Mines. They are one of our largest strategic shareholders. Uh, we did a deal with them back in 2016 to acquire our flagship project, Moore Lake, which uh, obviously I'll talk a bit more about later on in the presentation, but very close working relationship with Dave and his team at Denison. Um, Paul Matizic is a strategic advisor, well known in the mining industry. He's built and sold five mining companies over the last 15 years. And his biggest win was a uranium company, uh, which he sold for 1.8 billion uh, in 2007. Uh, more recently, we added some more capital markets expertise to our board of directors with Joseph Gulucci. So Joe, Joe is a um, investment banker at Laurentian Bank. Uh, he's a manager, managing director and, and the head of mining investment banking uh, at Laurentian in Montreal. Joy, Joe joined us um, about this time uh, last year uh, and again is going to be helping us on our capital marketing uh, side of the business. Uh, we go to, sorry, here's next slide. Uh, so just to round out the team, you'll see uh, a couple of uh, other names here on the board, uh, Don Houston, Amanda Chow, uh, independent directors. And then we have uh, Christine McKechnie and Dave Bayard, who are uh, our project geologists. They work closely with uh, Rick Kazmersky in Saskatoon. And one of the things I'd like to highlight is uh, on the technical side, on the geological side, uh, we have focused expertise uh, in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, the team has been, uh, again, looking for uranium there for many years. Uh, they've, they've worked throughout the Athabasca Basin. They've made many discoveries, and that's a very important part. Uh, this is a very specialized type of exploration. The discovery process is quite unique in the Athabasca Basin, and we have the right mixture uh, of people on the team, on the technical side to go out there and make that next big discovery in the basin. Just to quickly recap the capital structure. Uh, so you'll see about just over 99 million shares issued and outstanding. Uh, we're trading around a 24, $25 million market cap. It's moved up a little bit uh, in the last few days here. Uh, we do trade in Frankfurt and on the US OTC QB. You'll see the listing there uh, on the QB SYHBF. Uh, we do trade about 25 to 30% of our volume. So we've seen a pickup in uh, US both retail and institutional interest uh, in the last several years. Uh, some notable and strategic shareholders you'll see at the bottom, management and insiders. We own about 15% of the company, a lot of skin in the game. You can see with uh, my insider reporting that I've been continuously buying in the open market uh, over the last several years. Denison Mines, as I mentioned, is our largest strategic shareholder, corporate shareholder. Uh, Marin Katuza and the KCR Fund, OTP, uh, Sachem Cove, L2, uh, various institutional investors that uh, have come in on more recent financings. And I think that that's um, a, a good a signal uh, as to where this market's moving. We're seeing more institutional interest, even in smaller cap companies like Sky Harbor. There just aren't many companies that are actively exploring, developing and producing uranium. And so we do see capital that's interested in getting exposure uh, to uranium, uh, to this market, work its way down the value chain relatively quickly. So uh, I know we're going to spend a bit of time on this, and, and I, I, I'm assuming by last uh, presentation's Q&A that we'll, we'll want to talk a little bit more about this. But I, I think it's a very topical uh, point right now to discuss further. Um, we have seen since the last time I was on here a pretty notable move higher uh, in, in share prices uh, and in valuations um, across the board uh, with uranium companies. A, a part of that 
uh, has had to do with uh, the the green or clean energy move uh, and this uh, push uh, globally, both uh, from the public and from politicians to decarbonize and go carbon neutral. Uh, nuclear energy uh, is the only source of baseload emissions-free electricity. It's low-cost energy. It provides grid and price stability. It anchors local communities with jobs and a tax base. It's really the perfect mix. It's a great complement to renewables. We've seen a major rollout of renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, hydro uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, but nuclear still is that only 24-7 uh, baseload source of emissions-free electricity. Uh, what doesn't get talked about a lot uh, is something called capacity factor. And for nuclear energy, uh, most nuclear, uh, newer nuclear power plants can generate electricity to 90% capacity factor, whereas renewables range from 10 to 60%. So uh, it is going to be that backbone uh, for the clean energy movement going forward. And as I said, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to cannibalize uh, renewable and ener other renewable energy sources. It's really the uh, perfect source of, of that 24-7 uh, baseload energy. Uh, so if you look at just some of the numbers here, and I, I really do want to highlight these, um, some interesting numbers on pollution globally. You'll see here, uh, by some estimates, nuclear has saved over 3 million lives that would have been lost prematurely to deadly air pollution from energy alternatives. Uh, we see every year air pollution uh, a significant contributor to uh, deaths. Uh, you'll see there in 2012, a study that was done, air pollution claimed 7 million lives, 1 million in China alone. China is one of the largest sources of new demand for uranium as the fuel in nuclear reactors. So I can't emphasize uh, this, uh, this point enough. And what's significant is we're finally seeing the investment community wake up to this. We're finally seeing, it, it's just, it's in the early days. Uh, we, we still, there is still, a bit of a stigma with, with some investors out there around nuclear, but the ones that seem to be doing their due diligence, their homework on it, are finally waking up to the simple fact that uh, nuclear energy needs to play an important role uh, going forward. Uh, there was a recent uh, survey conducted by the UN. Uh, they surveyed 1.2 million people, massive, massive uh, survey that they conducted, uh, and they found that nearly two-thirds of those surveyed uh, view the uh, climate emergency as an existential threat. It's it's very topical right now, and in places like uh, Japan, Britain, Italy, Germany, France, Canada, uh, over two thirds uh, or, or three quarters of those that were surveyed uh, believe we have a climate emergency right now. Uh, just over the weekend or late last week, we saw the Japanese energy minister. Uh, reinforce their commitment to nuclear energy. That has been a bit of a sticking point for the industry. We we all know, uh, remember Fukushima and the natural or the uh, nuclear disaster that happened about 10 years ago. Uh, and that basically shut down all of Japan's nuclear reactors. It was a big hit to the industry. And it really did create uh, in our, for Sky Harbor, uh, what was an opportunity to go out and acquire projects at pennies on the dollar uh, at attractive valuations because the industry more or less was decimated uh, for a few years thereafter. And as I've said, we're, we're now coming out of that. We're seeing this notable recovery. Um, so just getting back to, uh, I want to highlight, let me pull up my drawing tool here. Um, this is something that we get asked about. So small modular reactors, um, these are uh, new advanced nuclear technologies and reactor models uh, that are standardized. They're much, uh, much uh, less permitting and lower cost to build. Uh, they range between five to 300 megawatts. Uh, you can uh, install them pretty much uh, anywhere. And there's a handful of companies globally that are advancing uh, and developing uh, these SMRs uh, and these uh, new nuclear reactors. Uh, they're simple designs, as I said, lower capital and operating cost. Uh, by some estimates, we could see this market uh, grow significantly over the next 15 years to 65 to 85 gigawatts. Uh, but what's interesting about it is in, in uh, analyst forecasts and in demand forecasts for uranium, there's really uh, no one paying attention uh, to this uh, potential new source of demand for uranium 
going forward. Uh, we continue to see forecasts based solely off of uh, larger reactors, uh, which I'll get to uh, shortly here. But I just want to draw people's attention to that because this is something that I believe in the Western world in particular will be a source of, of new demand going forward. And uh, just to give a couple of uh, other uh, points to discuss there. Uh, we've seen more recently in the UK, Rolls-Royce uh, announced uh, that they're planning to uh, uh, build uh, with the UK government uh, 16 SMRs um, at a cost of about 1.8 billion. So again, much lower cap capital cost and uh, investment than you would see in a larger reactor. Uh, the Western US utilities are planning 12 uh, new scale power SMRs uh, to be in commercial production by 2030. We've seen here in Canada, three provinces have signed an MOU uh, in late 2019 for the development and rollout of SMRs in Canada. And uh, it, it, it can, again, it can be, they're, they're versatile. They can be used for a, a number of uh, different situations. Ultra safe nuclear is building a micro reactor, uh, which uh, applicable for, for mining companies uh, could be used in lieu of diesel uh, for mining operations in remote uh, parts of the world. So that's just something that I wanted to draw people's attention to. Happy to discuss more uh, in the Q&A or offline. So just getting back uh, to why nuclear, this is a good case study uh, which shows the, the, uh, the pros and cons of, uh, of, of nuclear and, uh, and going uh, and, and, get, and getting rid of nuclear. We have two countries, Germany and France, and I've spent a, a fair bit of time in France. Our, we have a partnership with uh, Arano at one of our projects, and France has really been the, the poster child for uh, good civilian nuclear use over the last uh, several decades. They generate over 70% of their electricity from nuclear energy. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, post Fukushima, decided that they would try to phase out nuclear. Uh, and they've invested now uh, almost 200 billion euros into this green energy initiative uh, where they would roll out renewable energy sources like wind, like solar. Unfortunately, and like a lot of other parts of the world, uh, Germany is not the most conducive country uh, to wind and solar. So as a result of that, we've seen escalating electricity prices in Germany. Uh, and if you look at the numbers now on a per kilowatt carbon emissions basis, uh, France is about 10% that of Germany, while their electricity costs are about 50% that of Germany. So this is just a perfect case study, real world case study of what happens uh, when you try to force a renewable initiative or program uh, in, a, in a country, uh, in a place that isn't conducive to it. Again, I get back to the simple fact that nuclear will have to play an integral role in the energy mix going forward if we are to de decarbonize. And you look at places like uh, the US and Japan planning to go carbon neutral by 2050. China has plans by 2060 to be carbon neutral. Uh, again, uh, they have to, they have to resort to nuclear as that base load emissions free source of electricity. So now we can uh, get into the supply demand fundamentals. I think this is a, a very uh, important slide. Um, uh, when we look at the demand picture, um, uh, uranium, which is used as nuclear fuel in nuclear power plants, uh, you'll see here global demand for electricity expected to grow uh, by 76% uh, in the next decade. Uh, that number could increase with the advent of, of electric vehicles. Bottom line is we're seeing uh, a, a major amount of uh, electrification globally. Uh, and uh, I think as we, uh, again, continue to decarbonize uh, our electricity grids and we need to power our electric vehicles, uh, that will just uh, uh, play, uh, play an important role in adding new demand uh, for this uh, important metal. Uh, as far as nuclear operable nuclear reactors uh, go globally, there's 442 reactors currently operating, uh, 53 reactors under construction, and over 400 reactors that are ordered, planned, and proposed. And I, I just get back to the SMRs. That is not including any new rollout of SMRs globally. This is just with the current reactors uh, and the current reactor pipeline. So if we look at the numbers, uh, it's, this is quite compelling. So we have uh, right now about 180 million pounds of annual demand of uranium for the nuclear fleets globally. Um, that number I will note was um, 
relatively unaffected by the pandemic. Uh, that was a concern, a risk that we that we had uh, back in March and April. We wanted to see how how much of that would go offline uh, as a result of the pandemic. It was relatively negligible. Nuclear is one of the last sources of electricity you turn off uh, if you do have a uh, lower demand for electricity. So that's an important, it's relatively sticky demand and it is growing, as I mentioned, uh, not just with uh, the potential for SMRs, but as you can see there with 53 reactors under construction. Um, and then when we look at the supply side, this is what's really uh, driving the initial phase of this bull market and recovery. And this is uh, what we've seen in previous cycles where uh, a combination of low prices and more recently um, a, a somewhat of a supply shock with the pandemic, we've seen the primary mine supply fall from 163 million pounds just a few years ago. Uh, it was expected to be about 142 million pounds in 2020 with the pandemic and the mine closures uh, and disruptions that we saw throughout the year. Uh, that number has decreased to about 120 million pounds. So you're looking at a pretty major uh, supply deficit to the tune of 50 to 60 million pounds of a primary mine supply deficit. Uh, and one of the key takeaways here is that the risks to the supply side far far exceed the risks to the demand side. Again, relatively sticky demand and growing demand uh, in the backdrop of a supply side where you have highly concentrated supply, both geographically and geologically. We still have Cigar Lake, which is one of the largest mines uh, in the world in the Athabasca Basin. That's still offline because of COVID. And uh, earlier in the year, uh, we saw uh, a number of the uh, Kazakh ISR operations have to cut back production. Um, just to draw your attention here to this chart, this is also a very important uh, point. Um, so th what this represents is the growing uncovered requirement. So typically nuclear utilities contract uh, uh, their uranium. So they'll, they'll enter into long-term contracts to purchase uranium for five to 10 years uh, from the mining companies. Uh, and what this chart shows is over the next decade, we see a major increase uh, in uncovered requirements. Uh, and what this means is that these utilities are going to have to come back to the market and start contracting again. We can see by uh, 2025, there's uh, approximately 45 to 50 percent of the requirements that are uncovered. So that means there is going to be a rush of utility buying, I believe, in the next few years. And that's really, I believe, the last and ma major final catalyst for this market really to catch fire. Uh, I, I do think we will see that uh, start uh, in earnest this year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that or can address more questions uh, that you have about that in the Q&A. Uh, so just looking at it, breaking it down globally here, um, I'll start with China and India. Uh, and uh, these, these are really the two at the forefront of a new uh, nuclear reactor builds in uranium demand. Uh, they are building a lot of nuclear power generation. You'll see China there with 47 reactors and a dozen under construction. Uh, India just more recently announced plans for 21 new nuclear reactors by 2031. So these are the countries, uh, two in particular, there's also countries in the Middle East uh, that are uh, expanding and, and growing their uh, nuclear reactor uh, base and fleets. Uh, we will see that continue. Uh, Russia is an interesting country and player in this space. So Russia currently has just under 40 operating reactors, four under construction, uh, and a few dozen more planned, ordered, and proposed. But what's interesting about Russia uh, is Russia has a program where they basically outsource their nuclear industry, uh, build, own, operate program. So countries can hire uh, Russia and Russian uh, nuclear companies to build their reactors, operate these reactors, and therefore provide the fuel for these reactors. One of the things that's not getting a whole lot of press right now is the fact that Russia, Russian uranium mining companies account for about 20 million pounds of annual supply. And by some estimates, this build own operate program under the current pace uh, will, will require 50 million pounds about 10 years from now. So that's a pretty major shortfall that uh, the, the Russians are gonna have to make up for. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how they do that. But uh, if they continue with this aggressive build out and export of this industry, they will have to find material from somewhere. 
Moving on to Japan, uh, as I talked about a little bit earlier, we just uh, over the last week, uh, the Japanese energy minister uh, reinforced uh, their commitment to nuclear energy. Uh, it's expected to account for over 20% of their power uh, uh, by 2030, by 2035, about 30 reactors. So that's been, a again, a, a bit of a, a sore point for the industry. Um, it's taken longer than most expected uh, to have uh, Japanese uh, reactors come back online. But I think now with the clean energy uh, and uh, decarbonization narrative and push we're seeing globally, I could see that being expedited over the coming years. And then just to uh, finish off here with uh, what really has caught headlines uh, more recently, certainly since my last presentation with the election, the U.S., the American role uh, in this industry globally. So the U.S. is still the largest consumer of uranium. They have 96 operating reactors. Nuclear accounts for 20% of their electricity uh, generation. It accounts for 55% of their emissions-free electricity generation. And we just saw yesterday um, a pretty uh, positive report come out of Bank of America uh, and what they were talking about, and this was a reason you saw some of the uh, the uranium companies have a have, have a nice move yesterday. Uh, they are given now with Biden in. Uh, they are talking about uh, delaying uh, plant closures in the U.S. There's a, a handful of nuclear reactors that are slated to go uh, to be shut down in the next decade, uh, and there's now talks that that could be delayed. And in fact, there's uh, talks that these reactors could be extended to 100 year lives, which would be very significant. Uh, by their estimate, that would uh, boost global uranium, uranium demand by 26 million pounds over the next decade. Uh, and it would be, it certainly be precedent setting. Um, the election uh, with the Biden administration and the Democrats coming in, um, I think a lot in our industry were, were unsure of what, what that would really mean for nuclear, but, Given Biden's uh, aggressive climate change platform and policies, and we're clearly seeing that play out with his re the, the recent uh, decisions and policies around pipelines in the fossil fuel industry, uh, clearly uh, they are going to have to be pro-nuclear. It's the first time in almost 50 years that we've seen bipartisan support for nuclear energy in the United States. That's another key, key part here is that it does have uh, bipartisan support, uh, unlike most other issues uh, down in the U.S. And uh, just uh, in the last several months, we've seen a, a couple of notable new um, uh, legislative uh, uh, positive developments for the space in the U.S., uh, including a strategic uranium reserve budget of 1.5 billion over the next 10 years. So they're gonna they're gonna uh, start to uh, build this uh, domestic stockpile. They're starting with a 75 million budget uh, in fiscal 2021, uh, and then uh, more recently uh, there was the uh, extension an amendment to what's called the Russian Suspension Agreement, which is basically the U.S. Um, reducing imports of Russian uranium uh, into the United States. And that's quite significant because uh, that does have positive implications for Canadian and Australian companies, as well as obviously American uranium mining companies. So we'll move on to uh, uranium supply. And this is, uh, uh, I think, a key uh, chart or image uh, here where you can see the aggregate impact of restricted primary mine supply. This is going to be updated, you know, likely see uh, where it uh, uh, in 2022, you'll likely see these uh, supply um, uh, the, the supply disruption that we saw in 2020 uh, extend into 2021 and likely even further. Uh, but uh, a couple of key takeaways here, uh, again, with the pandemic, uh, we saw at one point in April, uh, about 50% of primary global mine supply offline. Uh, as I pointed out in uh, the slide previously, we've seen primary mine supply decrease consistently over the last few years. Most of that had to do with the low price uh, of uranium. The bottom line is uranium is trading at $30 a pound. Uh, very few 
operating mines make money at $30 a pound. Uh, they've been able to uh, get by through um, uh, legacy contracts where they've been able to sell their product and their material at higher prices. Uh, the price needed to incentivize new production to come online is closer to 50 to 60 dollars a pound. So an almost doubling of where it is right now. Uh, but bottom line is the low price environment uh, drove uh, a number of shutdowns. It drove a number of project deferrals and production curtailment. And that was exacerbated by the pandemic. And, and again, uh, we, we saw again in April and May uh, at one point, uh, almost 50% offline. Uh, the Kazakhs just came out with their numbers uh, yesterday where uh, their production for 2020 was down almost almost 20% from 2019 uh, and their well field development because all of their mines are uh, in situ recovery, ISR mines, their well, well field development was, was hard hit too. So we could see that production curtailment and that supply disruption linger uh, for some time to come. Uh, so again, a, a key takeaway here is um, the risks to the supply side, uh, the, the, the chances, the probability or potential for there being future supply disruptions. Uh, again, when you have just a few operating mines globally that account for a large percentage uh, of global primary mine supply, if any one or a number of those mines goes offline, it has an immediate impact on the market and we're now we now have a major uh, a supply deficit to the tune of 50 to 60 million pounds that's eating into inventories that's eating into secondary supplies uh, and and ultimately what that is going to force is utility companies that have not been contracting they've been sitting on their hands it's going to force them back to the market uh, likely in a herd mentality where you get uh, a handful of them coming in all at once to contract and to purchase material. Uh, in previous cycles, that's always been really the, the fuel on the fire, if you will. And I, I suspect we'll see that here in the coming years with, uh, uh, with given where the market's at right now. So again, happy to answer uh, any more macro related uranium questions. Uh, happy to talk about the market, the dynamics, the fundamentals. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the Q&A. We'll move on now. I want to save some time here for Q&A, so I'll, I'll try to uh, get through the project section uh, as quickly as possible as we, we covered it extensively in the last presentation. Uh, I'll start with this slide. Uh, why the Athabasca Basin? Uh, as I pointed out earlier, all of our projects are in the basin. Uh, the Athabasca Basin is the highest grade depository of uranium in the world. You have a unique uh, set of geological characteristics and factors that have led to the deposition of what are the highest value types of mineral deposits out there. Uh, if you look at MacArthur River, you look at Cigar Lake, uh, you look at some of these other uh, high grade uh, uranium deposits in the basin, the value per ton of rock uh, is incredible. Uh, and you'll see the great equivalence uh, of uranium here, 1% U308 is equivalent to about 14 grams per ton of gold, uh, over 850 grams per ton of silver, 12% copper. Uh, and I'll just note at our flagship project, Moore Lake, uh, we've had drill intercepts uh, return grades as high as 21% U308. Uh, so again, it just shows you the, uh, the potential uh, to make uh, major discoveries of high value per ton rock. And uh, it's really the only place in the world uh, that you have this, uh, the average grade of these deposits in the basin is uh, 10 to 20 times that of the average grade of uranium deposits globally. I'll skip ahead here to uh, the uh, uh, couple of charts here at the bottom and talk a little bit about some recent discoveries and successes in the Athabasca Basin. So as a uranium exploration company, uh, our main value driver uh, and value uh, creator is through the drill bit. Uh, we go out there, we are looking to uh, find the next big uranium deposit in the Athabasca Basin. We feel like we're, we're hot on the trail right now with uh, our flagship project. Uh, we've, uh, over the last several years, carried out a number of drill programs. There is a small deposit there that we've expanded, but uh, more recently, we've been looking uh, in a new geological setting called the Basement Rocks, and we've been having success with the early days uh, of drilling and testing these, these deeper targets. Uh, but just uh, to uh, recap some of the recent success stories that we're looking to emulate at Sky Harbor, uh, 
Uh, at the bottom here, you'll see a few charts, uh, and these are all charts of companies that were successful in making high-grade uranium discoveries in the Athabasca Basin. You'll see Next Gen Energy there, second largest publicly uh, traded uranium company uh, now in Canada. Uh, they've gone from uh, a small cap, micro cap, to a, a billion and a half dollar company on the back of a major and high-grade discovery over on the west side of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, Fission Uranium, another great example of a, a major discovery uh, that was made recently in the Athabasca Basin. More recently, ISO Energy has gone from a $20, $30 million company to north of $200 million uh, on the back of a high-grade uh, uh, basin discovery over on the east side of the Athabasca Basin where most of our project base is. And one of the reasons that you're seeing this uh, in a relatively short period of time is there are new techniques and methodologies that we're employing, that exploration companies are employing to make these discoveries at a lower cost. Used to be where you went out and you did some rudimentary geophysics, uh, you get some you know, basic targets and you go and you drill uh, as many holes as you could or as you could fund uh, until you found a high grade uranium deposit. Well, these are uh, relatively small tonnage deposits. They're not easy to find if you're just if you're just drilling a bunch of holes. Uh, it's really like finding a needle in a haystack. So more recently, uh, new geophysical techniques, um, better understanding of the geology and the geochemistry. Uh, uh, new uh, ground surveys that uh, that we uh, can now use uh, to better identify and refine targets uh, are, are now at our, our disposal and we can go out there and we can use these new techniques uh, and methodologies to uh, increase the chances of making a discovery, but also bring your discovery cost down. It's, it's great if you find something, but if it costs you hundreds of millions of dollars, to go and find it, your return on investment uh, is uh, not that great. So that's something that we focus on and we take pride at uh, Sky Harbor is uh, using these new techniques, uh, drone, for example, drone flown geophysics uh, that uh, give us a, a better image of what's happening in the basement rocks, uh, something that we've employed uh, more recently that we've had success with. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we work our way through here. Um, so just to uh, cover off the projects uh, before I, uh, the, the, the entire project base, before I get into the specifics of, of, of each project, uh, you'll see here, here's a map of the Athabasca Basin. You'll see Sky Harbor's projects uh, scattered throughout, again, six projects covering uh, about 240,000 hectares of property. Um, you'll see our flagship project here. I'll just uh, draw a little arrow to it. This is Moore Lake. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the crown jewel for the company. Again, a, a project that we acquired from our, our partner Denison back in 2016. That's where the focus for the exploration and the news flow has been more recently and will be for uh, this upcoming year. Uh, outside of that, we have other projects uh, that we are looking to bring partner companies in or have already brought partner companies into. And you'll see here East Preston, Preston, and more recently, what's called North Falcon Point. Uh, these are all projects that we have now consummated option agreements on uh, with partner companies. Uh, at our Preston project, we have industry leader Arano, France's largest uranium mining and nuclear fuel cycle company, uh, as a option uh, and joint venture partner there. Uh, they can earn up to 70% by spending $8 million, most of that in exploration expenditures. East Preston, just beside it, uh, is uh, operated by a, a partner company of ours called Azincourt. Again, they can earn up to 70% by spending about $5 million in exploration dollars, cash payments, and share issuance to Sky Harbor. And then just more recently, and since my last presentation, we announced a definitive agreement with a new Australian company called Valor Resources uh, at our North Falcon Point project. Uh, and at this project, Valor can earn up to 80% uh, by spending uh, in total about five million in project considerations, three and a half million in exploration, uh, and just under half a million in cash payments over a three-year period, and they'll be issuing us uh, over two hundred and thirty-three million shares of the company, which at the close uh, in the last trading day in Australia was about one point six, one point seven million dollars worth of stock. Just before uh, I move on, I will note that this project base, we spent several years acquiring. Uh, we were very meticulous with 
acquiring these projects. Uh, the uh, total expenditure to build this portfolio was just over $5 million Canadian. In the last bull market, in the last uranium, big uranium bull market, 2006, 2007, these two projects, Moore Lake and Falcon Point, were in a company that was valued at over 300 million. Uh, so it just shows you the kind of re-rating potential uh, when we do see, uh, I believe, uh, the next big uranium bull market, uh, we're well positioned uh, to uh, see uh, a pretty significant increase in the valuation uh, based off of the, the asset base that we've we've put together. Uh, and you'll see here we have uh, a handful of other projects to complement just those two. So I'll skip ahead here. Uh, again, I don't uh, want to leave some time for Q&A. Um, Talking a little bit about our flagship project, Moore Lake. Um, so this is a project that uh, we've been focused on for the last several years. Uh, it's a big property over on the east side of the Athabasca uh, Basin. It's adjacent to infrastructure, to road, to mills, to power. Uh, what's interesting about this project was it was my geological team that made the initial discovery here back in the early 2000s. And you'll see some very high grade uh, drill results uh, over uh, you know the 20 year uh, period. Uh, since the initial discovery was made. What's exciting about this project, though, is more recently we've been testing uh, targets in a new geological setting, what's called the basement rocks. And so there's there's essentially two types of uranium deposits in the basin. There are sandstone or unconformity hosted deposits, and then there are basement hosted deposits. The underlying basement rocks is where the feeder zones for the mineralization, the structures that carry the fluids up, that's where they sit. And that's typically, uh, as we've seen with more recent discoveries, that's typically where you can find very high grade zones of uranium mineralization and larger deposits. Uh, so more recently, we've we've carried out uh, a couple of exploratory drill programs. We have plans for uh, drilling to commence here uh, shortly as well. Um, and uh, through this year, we're fully funded for all of our uh, programs that we have planned at Moore Lake this year. Uh, but these programs, again, are focused in the underlying basement rocks. And you'll see here, we just announced actually in early December and early January results uh, from a drill program we carried out in the fall of last year. Uh, and you'll see uh, some of the numbers here that we announced with a few of the drill holes. Um, so you'll see 0.72% over 17 and a half meters included in that is 1% over 10 meters. And what's significant about this is the width of those intercepts. Uh, these are the longest zones of continuous mineralization that have been discovered yet at the project. Uh, we'd like to see a bit higher grade, but we feel like we're, we, we've just nicked something much larger. We feel that with additional drill programs, we will, we will tap into something uh, that's much larger and higher grade. But what's significant about this is the width of these zones in the basement rocks. We're seeing that uh, opposed to the five, six, seven meter zones we would see historically on the project, we're seeing much long, longer continuous zones of mineralization. So as I said, fully funded for upcoming drilling, uh, keep an eye out for news flow on that. Uh, we typically carry out a couple of drill programs a year. Uh, this is a key catalyst uh, and, and source of news flow for the company. Uh, and uh, I believe given uh, what we've discovered, what we've been finding in the most recent drill programs, uh, we're poised to make a, a new a major discovery here uh, in the upcoming drill programs in the basement rocks. So moving on, um, just to cover off some of the other projects and then we can uh, get into the Q&A. Uh, so this is a part of our prospect generator business where we have partner companies come in uh, and uh, under an option agreement, uh, earning in at the project, uh, ultimately looking to form a joint venture partnership. Uh, the first uh, two option partners uh, that we did deals with back in 2017 were at our Preston and East Preston projects. You'll see the uh, the map here. This is over on the west side of the Athabasca Basin uh, and uh, it's proximal to Fission and to NextGen and a couple of other operators in that area. Uh, it's an exciting area for the basin. It's uh, new. It's new. There's these new discoveries that have been made in the last 10 to 15 years. So it's ripe for discoveries. Um, it's, uh, it's an area that we initially uh, acquired uh, our first properties in and uh, we carried out some work uh, uh, back in 2014, 2015. Uh, but ultimately what we decided to do was find partner companies that we could pass the baton off to. And uh, we've done that with uh, Arano and Azincourt. And you'll see here a combined uh, 
project consideration of about 11 and a half million between the two companies. The bulk of that in exploration expenditures, uh, some cash payments and some share issuance as well uh, from Azincourt. Uh, just recently, uh, Azincourt's announced plans for a drill program uh, about 25, 2,000 to 2,500 meters at our East Preston project. Uh, they will have completed their earning uh, and uh, they have to make a small cash payment to complete that. At that point, it will be a joint venture partnership. Uh, but again, we, we benefit from cash payments, share issuance and uh, uh, project the project exploration and development work being funded by these partner companies. And if they do have success with the exploration, if they do make a major discovery, uh, we retain a minority interest. So we will benefit uh, with that retained minority interest and uh, even a, a 15, 20, 30% minority interest in a major Athabasca Basin discovery, uh, that's worth a lot. Um, so if we move on to the next slide here, North Falcon Point. Uh, again, this is more recent news uh, that's come out of the company. Uh, having just signed a definitive agreement with a new Australian company, Valor Resources. You'll see the numbers here at the bottom. Uh, total project consideration of uh, just under $4 million, the bulk of that uh, in exploration expenditures. You'll likely see some news flow uh, on their exploration plans uh, over the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, they do have plans to get right to work there uh, in February and March, starting with some geophysics and then ultimately looking to carry out a small initial drill program uh, in the summer months. Uh, I'll also just direct your attention to the the share issuance, and it's a, a lot of stock. As I pointed out earlier, it's it's at the close today. It's valued at about. Uh, 1.7, 1.8 million. Um, this is great for us. We're excited to participate in the upside. We we think that um, the, the, the group that's running it, uh, led by a gentleman out of Perth, a mining executive named, named George Bach. Uh, he's built uh, several mining companies over his career. Uh, he has a lot of experience in the uranium sector, very capable uh, mining executive. And uh, his, his partner, geological partner in Saskatoon, Gary Billingsley, I spoke with this morning. Um, uh, again, been uh, working in, in Saskatchewan for many decades. Uh, they're the right group to, to lead uh, this company forward. And we're excited to, again, participate in the upside as a major shareholder of the company. Um, move on here. So uh, I won't uh, spend too much time on these other projects. Um, I will note uh, that uh, there are a handful of projects that we own 100% in uh, that we are looking to uh, bring in uh, new partner companies on. South Falcon Point is the most advanced of those projects. It does host an NI43-101 compliant resource, about 7 million pounds of uranium. It's at a lower grade, 0.03%, uh, but right at surface, uh, and there's depth potential uh, and the potential for higher grade mineralization uh, below the, the current deposit uh, area. There's also a, a small thorium credit uh, and rare earth credit as well. Um, so it's it's a great project in the portfolio, but again, uh, we are entertaining a uh, joint venture and option partner uh, deals right now. We would like to bring in a company that can advance this so that we can uh, stay focused at our flagship Moore Lake project. Uh, the same goes for uh, Yurchison uh, here, which is uh, has both uranium and base metal potential. You'll see some historical uh, drilling and trench work that was done. Uh, great project. It's uh, road accessible. Uh, it's a project that uh, uh, just to the actually the south uh, west of us, uh, you can't really see it too well on this map, but right down here, uh, Rio, uh, Rio Tinto uh, has a, a $30 million earning option uh, on a project called Janus Lake, uh, which is owned, uh, owned by a company called Form. Uh, they just announced a drill program that they've commenced. So a lot of uh, regional work being done and we have all the ground along trend uh, to the uh, to the northeast as you can see here and then last but not least man lake um, it's right uh, in the thick of things in the east side of the basin uh, it's just north of uh, uh, of our northwest of our uh, uh, more lake project and you'll see here uh, there was a pretty significant discovery made just a few years back at the adjacent uh, 
property. Uh, Denison ended up acquiring a minority stake uh, in that project by acquiring a company that was called International Inexco back in 2014. Uh, and uh, what we're looking for there is the extension of uh, some of these cross-cutting structures uh, that would host mineralization onto our project. But again, uh, it's an, a, a secondary asset, a project we own 100% of uh, that we would like to find a partner company to come in on and explore as a part of our prospect generator part of the business. Uh, so just to recap um, and finish off here, uh, again, I'll get back to those three main talking points, people, timing, and projects. Uh, we have a great mix of uh, management and capital markets expertise uh, and uh, a technical team that has focused uh, experience in the Athabasca Basin that's made high-grade uranium discoveries in the past. Timing with the uranium market, I think, again, we're in the very early days of a recovery here. Very few ways to play the sector. Uh, and just in the last three or four months, we've seen uh, I think what is the, the first inning of uh, a notable move higher uh, with the uranium stocks. Um, and as we see the, uh, the ESG narrative continue to, to gain momentum, I think you'll see nuclear and uranium mining companies swept up in that as well. And then last but not least, the projects. High grade discovery potential at our flagship uh, Moore Lake project. Uh, we're going to be continuing to drill there uh, in the coming months, in the coming years. We feel like we're on the verge of making a major discovery there. And then projects funded by partner companies, uh, now three partner companies in Arano, Azincourt, and uh, more recently Valor. Uh, combined project consideration between those three deals is about 18 million uh, in exploration expenditures, cash payments, and share issuance. Uh, so I think without uh, spending any more time, uh, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I want to leave a couple minutes here uh, open for Q&A, and uh, I'm very accessible. Anyone that wants to connect offline, uh, happy to do so. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan. So let's just jump into Q&A now for the last 10 minutes. Uh, Max has a question. When are the options and warrants coming to life, and at what price are they exercisable? Also, what will the need for additional funding and the potential share dilution through private placement in 2021 be? Yeah, so um, the warrants and options, um, we, we I can get the average warrant and option exercise price. It, it, off the top of my head, uh, the weighted average price uh, would be around um, 30 cents, 28 to 30 cents. Um, you know, there's there's some warrants. Um, the, I think the, the, the lowest warrants we have are at 22. And then there's other warrants um, at uh, 45, 50, and I believe some at 60 even still. Um, mo most of the options are um, in the high 20s or low 30s as well. Um, and uh, but that I, I can I can uh, we can uh, you can pull that from the website. Uh, there's a list of the exercise prices and the and the uh, time left on them. As far as the financing needs for the company go, uh, you'll see uh, just in December we we raised uh, about a million and a half flow through dollars. Uh, it was one lead order. It was actually there's a fund. Um, uh, in Toronto, that's uh, been the lead order on our last few financings, uh, and they become a very large shareholder. Uh, and so we have over two and a half million in the treasury. Uh, the, the the budget for the upcoming drill program at Moore Lake is about eight hundred thousand. So we're we're well funded for that and for future programs. Uh, but just to add to that point, um, as I mentioned, we do have option payments uh, both in cash and stock coming in from partner companies. Uh, so we have a two hundred thousand dollar payment coming from uh, Azincourt to complete their earning a $50,000. These are cash payments uh, coming in from Valor. And then we get the 233 million shares uh, free trading in Valor. Um, uh, we'll be getting that shortly. And again, uh, that's valued at uh, just under 2 million as of today's close. Uh, so if you add that, uh, that's about uh, another two and a half, three million uh, that you can uh, that you can add uh, or to call it two million that you could add to uh, the treasury. So um, uh, we're we're well positioned financially. Um, we that's a that's a great benefit of being a prospect generator is you have partner companies that fund the exploration and you get some cash in stock. And keep an eye out. That's going to be a potential catalyst uh, coming up along with drill results and exploration at our project base is uh, getting additional deals done at our other projects that we own 100% of. Great. 
Next question we have is, what are the mineral resources at Moore Lake and at what cutoff grade are they estimated? For example, what is the operating cost in the calculation of cutoff grade? Uh, great question. I can't give you the answer on that. Uh, we are working towards a maiden resource estimate at Moore Lake. Um, and uh, so look out for that later in the year. Uh, we expect we'll have something out here probably in the second half. Uh, of 2021. Uh, and so uh, at that point, I can talk a little bit more about the size of the deposit um, and uh, uh, with, with those numbers in hand. I will note, you can see from the previous drilling uh, and, and even more recently, the results that we've announced, uh, you know, there, there are these high grade pods or lenses of mineralization, most of it in the sandstone or at the end conformity, uh, which is interesting in and itself because of some of these new uh, mining methods that are being talked about in the basin uh, or being proposed in the basin, including ISR and Sabre. Uh, but our, we believe our real exploration upside, discovery upside lies in the basement rocks. And, and we really just scratched the surface uh, with just a few uh, drill holes down into these uh, basement to, to test these basement targets in the last few programs. Great. Um, Mark asks, any U.S. equity coverage? Uh, no, we do not have U.S. Uh, equity coverage right now. Um, FRC does uh, have coverage. Um, uh, we are going to be doing uh, Red Cloud. We're going to be at their conference coming up. Um, they've helped raise money. Um, uh, you could see something there. And uh, uh, I think as you see um, the company grow, I mean, you know, the simple answer there is we still are a, a smaller company, um, you know, at sub 30 million market cap. We're kind of right at that threshold. But I think as you see that uh, that move higher, I think you'll start to see uh, new research uh, and new coverage initiated. Uh, and uh, yeah, look in the U.S., um, uh, I've I've done a fair bit of marketing in the U.S. As I mentioned, we, we have a fairly large U.S. shareholder base, uh, and it does trade good volume on the OTCQB. Uh, we, it would be great to get coverage uh, in the U.S., and and I think we can achieve that here in the in the coming year. Great. All right. So in closing, um, what are the near term catalysts for the price of uranium? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, we talked at length about what's uh, been driving it over the last few years, and in particular in the last few months um, with the clean energy um, and decarbonization push globally. That's, I think, been one of the reasons we've seen this initial move higher. What's going to be the major and main catalyst coming up is going to be new utility contracting. Um, that's really the historically that's where you see um, most uranium transacted and bought um, through these contracts. Uh, we, we know that utility companies globally have uh, really just been sitting on their hands the last several years. We've seen this a lot of a lot of volume in the spot market versus the contract and long term market. I think you see that change here. I think uh, 2021 is going to be the year uh, where utility companies, uh, given that they've been drawing down inventory um, over the last several years, they're going to have to come back to the market. And that's usually historically that is usually the biggest driver for a move higher in the uranium price. Wonderful. Well, that's a great place to close up. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you so much, Jordan, for taking us through the presentation and the Q&A session. I also want to thank everyone who submitted questions. If you didn't get a chance to get your questions answered or if you think of one after, we will be emailing you out a survey where you have the opportunity to leave your contact details and the Sky Harbor team will be happy to follow up with you directly. And for more information, please visit Sky Harbor Resources website at www.skyharborltd.com. Um, and as always, the um, recording of this presentation will be available on six.com. So now I'll hand it back to you, Jordan, for the final word. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for taking the time. Um, I hope that was informative. Uh, I hope uh, for those of you who saw the last presentation, you have an update. We have a, a lot going on uh, coming up in 2021, uh, both at our projects and uh, in the Iranian market. Uh, I'm very excited for the year coming up. We're well funded uh, to advance the company and the project base. Uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to some of the upcoming catalysts through uh, our drill programs and our partner funded drill programs. Uh, as well as uh, new developments in the uranium market uh, globally.